Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I offer my congratulations to all of you for braving the benedicity and managing to get here tonight. Uh, it's uh, great to see you all. Um, I set out in this series to talk frankly about judging, and I've concentrated on the role of the trial judge in the family court and court of protection proceedings. I've done that for three reasons. First, because it's received little academic attention. Partly, secondly, because these are areas where a great enlargement of discretionary powers has been seen. And thirdly, because it happens to reflect my own experience. So over this period, we've been considering the role and purpose of the judge and the tension between privacy and transparency. We've reflected on the fact-finding process and the inherent tensions between proof, truth and justice. We've examined the role of the judges as the gatekeepers of the state's powers to intervene in private family life, whether through uh, the threshold criteria in the Children Act or the concept of capacity in the Mental Capacity Act. And we have noted the range of the interventions that are available. Now we turn to the actual discretionary powers themselves and the basis on which they're exercised. Our concern now is the role of the judge as regulator of the state's lawful interventions in private life. Now the discretionary powers of the modern judge are seen most vividly and most controversially in the areas of child welfare and best interests of those unable to make their own decisions. And the question that concerns us is this, are these discretionary powers compatible with any understanding of justice. The former Lord Chief Justice and President of the Supreme Court, uh, Lord Bingham, in a book called The Rule of Law, wrote this, questions of legal right and liability should ordinarily be resolved by the application of the law and not by the exercise of discretion. And he concludes his chapter, which is entitled Law, Not Discretion, with these words, no discretion should be unconstrained so as to be potentially arbitrary. No discretion may be legally unfettered. Interestingly, Lord Bingham does not discuss family law or mental capacity law, but their practice, at least superficially, does not always sit easily with the principle that he identifies and one with which most would want to agree. Now, of course, even in these areas, discretion is not legally unfettered. The jurisdiction is conferred by statute, principally by Section 1 of the Children Act 1989, Section 1 of the Adoption and Children Act 2002, and Section 4 of the Mental Capacity Act 2005. But the jurisdiction is, however, very wide. And in many cases, it is the truly controversial aspect of the dispute. It is made more difficult by the fact that not only may there be more than one reasonable outcome in any given case, but that only one decision is required or permitted. These areas are deeply affected by human emotions, which may not be effectively constrained by rationality, although they may be, as we shall see, seriously constrained by the practicable. I've often thought that family law is essentially the management of the consequences of human failure, so as best to protect those least able to protect themselves. Now, of course, that approach does not always make for consistency. It's not as if Parliament has not intended and attempted to place some fetters on discretion, because it lists matters that the court is required to take into account in making the welfare of the child its paramount consideration. Thus, for example, Section 1 of both the 1989 and the 2002 Act provides a checklist of subjects that must be considered. And likewise, Section 4 of the 2005 Mental Capacity Act lists matters which the court must take into account. These include, in respect of children, the views of the child, uh, together with the age, gender, any specific needs of the child, and any risk that he may be at harm, uh, at risk of suffering, any harm that he may be at risk of suffering. Those are all matters you would expect to find. What the statutes do not do, however, 
is either to make the lists exhaustive or to provide any hierarchy of importance as between those issues, let alone suggesting any answers. So long as the judge has taken account of all the matters mentioned in the statute, or at least says he has, the judge decides both priority and also the relevance of other factors. In practice, the discretion, if not actually unfettered, is in truth very wide. It is, of course, important to remember, as we saw last time, that the court can't simply interfere because it takes upon itself a view about welfare or best interests. It can only interfere where invited by the family to do so, or whether the threshold criteria of fact have been proved, or where the court is satisfied that the person lacks capacity to make that particular decision. That is the judge's role as gatekeeper. Nevertheless, that leaves a large number of cases in which the court can and is required to exercise this very wide discretion. It seems to be the case that the concepts of welfare and best interests are interchangeable and merely depend on which statute is under consideration. In the field of medical cases, the terms used are indeed used interchangeably. And as the maximum age under the Children Act is 18 and the minimum age and Mental Capacity Act is 16, it's just as well that that is so. But for convenience, I will use the term welfare when talking about children and best interests when talking about adults, just as the statutes do, but I draw no distinction in meaning between the two terms. As I say, we're now concerned with the role of judge as the regulator of the exercise of these powers. You will have appreciated two things about these concepts. First, they are value-laden, and secondly, they're liable to change as society changes. We've thought about our judge from 1955, but in fact, major changes can take place within much shorter timescales. Same-sex parenting and surrogacy arrangements are perhaps two obvious examples, neither of which was even on the agenda when I began practice and still bordered on the unmentionable when I first became a judge in 1992. Changes happen more frequently than legislators provide, and so the modern judge has to undertake an unfamiliar role in the discernment or even formulation and development of those changes. It may be instructive to see how this works in practice. We have seen, have we not, that social values have become much more diverse in recent times as we have seen that judges personally may hold a very diverse range of values. In consequence, when the court is considering the exercise of discretion, a value-laden concept, it will often be addressing at least three potentially competing sets of values. There will be the values of the society itself, insofar as they can be discerned. There will be the values of the family or families engaged in the particular case, and the judge's own values, which are inevitably engaged. Let me take three examples to show you how this can work. First, a family wishes to practice uh, female genital mutilation because that is within the custom and tradition of that family. Now, on that question, society and the judges speak with one voice and family values must give way and others take precedence. But take the issue of male circumcision. I'm not sure that society itself actually has a stance on the issue of male circumcision other than a general feeling that that kind of thing shouldn't be done if not therapeutically required. Judges themselves may have strong personal views either way on the subject, but the family view may be crucial if that is the group and culture within which that child is to grow up and for him, because it will be a him, not to be seen to be an outsider or a stranger. And accordingly, in those circumstances, the family values 
may have to prevail. Then thirdly, take the question of the physical discipline of children, a divisive issue irrespective of race, age, gender, class or culture. In those circumstances, the court may not be able to go any further than merely requiring compliance with the criminal law. Resolving conflicts of value is often at the heart of the discretionary exercise, but it is not necessarily the whole of it. For the question of welfare is also constrained simply by what is practicable. In a family dispute, the court will rarely go against a parental agreement. That is partly because we respect the rights of parents to make such agreements, even if we thought they could do better, but partly out of a recognition that it would be very difficult to enforce something else if the child is to remain with the parents. Discretion may have to be tempered by what is practicable. Again, a discretionary opinion based on welfare may have to be tempered by consequence. You may remember all the public fuss surrounding the decision of Mrs. Justice Palfley up in the Northeast when she was accused of allowing parents viciously to beat their children, when in fact the case was no more than an acceptance that the consequences of removing the child may be even more harmful than that. And given the willingness on the part of the parents to reconsider their circumstances, it was a case in which welfare would have to bow to what it would have preferred to avoid because the consequences of removal would have been so much more serious. As we saw last time, the court system simply cannot relieve children of all the consequences of what adults around them choose to do. Again, as ever, in any question involving human rights, as the exercise of discretion undoubtedly does, there is the question of proportionality to be applied to welfare. Let me take two examples from adult cases, one of which I think I have mentioned before. A young woman with significant learning difficulties was addicted to sexual activity and had in consequence been repeatedly and seriously abused to the extent that she regarded rape as merely one of the incidences of life that had to be tolerated. Her protection could only be secured by requiring her both to live in supervised accommodation and to be the subject of two-to-one supervision whenever she left. But that could not be required during the whole of her sexually active life, for it would have resulted in both a cost and an intrusion into personal life grossly disproportionate to the risk, however acute that in fact was. A balance simply had to be struck and her best interests had to accommodate that balance and thus these restrictions would be withdrawn once she had learned all that she was able to learn about self-protection. We'll take the case of a woman who formed a relationship with a man who was subsequently subjected to a lengthy prison sentence for the serial abuse of his previous wives. She this woman, who had significant learning difficulties, married him whilst he was in prison. In due course, he was released and his license period expired and she was quite unable to see that he might pose any risk to her at all and both wished, wished to resume cohabitation. The formal psychiatric advice was that she should have no contact with this man at all and doubtless you can understand why. But the fact was that she was married and both wanted to cohabit. Compulsory segregation was simply disproportionate. And again, her best interests had to accommodate that balance with such voluntary protection as could be devised. So proportionality there not only requires the least interven intervention consistent with best interests, but may sometimes require a reassessment of those best interests. The exercise of discretion involves a deeply human judgment which may not always accord 
with a purely rational assessment. On the other hand, best interests are governed neither by culpability nor by sentiment. Of course, if parents have deliberately injured or killed a child, then the adoption by strangers of that child or surviving siblings is not a difficult outcome to contemplate. However, removal and adoption may be no less necessary where parental failure stems not from culpability, but from inadequacy or even infirmity, though it may be an altogether much more difficult outcome to contemplate. Let me offer you a couple of examples, again, from my uh, judicial experience. A single mother with a young daughter, uh, the mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Gradually, the roles of mother and daughter were reversed, and the child, fiercely loyal to the mother though she was, was at serious risk of losing her childhood. Everyone recognized that this could not go on indefinitely, but the emotional difficulties of intervening were self-evident. In the end, the girl was removed and went to her separated father, but not without a great deal of heartbreak. Or again, take a case of a boy of 10 with severe cerebral palsy who was wheelchair confined. His parents would not or could not cope and the parental siblings all had families and responsibilities of their own. And accordingly, the care of this boy had fallen to the maternal grandparents, who had actually done rather well. But they acknowledged that they could not care for him alone till he was 18, let alone beyond that, he being one who would need lifelong care. The local authority had found an adoptive couple who would commit to this boy for life. And the local authority argued that a decision and a change should be made sooner rather than later, an entirely logical argument. In the end, I refused to remove him because I believed first in the need to retain the good that he had for as long as that could be done, and also a belief that the rest of the family would in truth rally round as the grandparental strengths waned. Was I right? I simply do not know. Best interests are not purely rational. They have an element of proportionality and indeed as of instinct. And often, as here, there was more than one answer, but only one decision is allowed to the judge. This was, I think, discretion far removed from Lord Bingham's secure founding of rights in the law. One aspect of discretion that is becoming increasingly recognized is the role that the child or the incapacitated adult should have in the assessment of their own best interests. The court must take account of the wishes and feelings of the child, making due allowance for age and understanding. The communication of those views in public law is the responsibility of the guardian, and in private law, the CAFCAS reporting officer if indeed one has been appointed. Otherwise, the judge is dependent on what the parents say the children's wishes are. And they, of course, have often only been told what the child thinks they want to hear. I favor the judge seeing children in principle, but only where parents, guardian, and child all support it, because I am very reluctant further to embroil the child in a dispute by seeing them if it is deeply controversial to do so, unless, of course, there is some special ground like a strongly expressed view by an older child. Though even here, communication by letter may be sufficient. It is very difficult to be prescriptive about these matters beyond the rather general statutory requirement to consider wishes and feelings. Again, it is very difficult to be prescriptive about the weight that is to be given to those wishes and feelings once expressed. Sometimes it will be decisive. Sometimes I suspect that although the adolescent young person is perfectly intelligent and highly articulate, all I am actually hearing 
is the child of, of the voice piece of one of the competing parents. And in those circumstances, little weight will be given to it. The voice will always be relevant, but will always be subject to the judge's overall assessment of welfare. And we saw that when we were thinking last time about the competent young person who wants to refuse medical treatment. This question of hearing the person's voice can be even more difficult in the case of an adult, for there may be no independent reporter involved. Section 4 of the Mental Capacity Act requires the court not only to consider the express wishes of the protected person, but what those wishes would have been had he been competent to express them, together with the values and beliefs that would have underpinned those views. Now, that is an entirely fair and healthy requirement but it is not always easy to discern precisely what it is, whereas is often the case, there is no written expression of view executed whilst the person was still competent. Moreover, the protected person's condition may and often does prevent any close personal involvement in the court process itself. We have, I think, still quite a long way to go before we can be confident that the protected person's voice is clearly and accurately heard in capacity proceedings. The developing role of the independent mental capacity advocate promises much, but they come at a price that the state may not always be willing to pay. There is a further issue related to this. What is it that children actually are allowed to know about their own backgrounds? In the field of adoption, we've now effectively got a consensus that children should know all about it. A good life storybook and a willingness truthfully to answer the questions asked, but not those that have not been asked, will in practice meet those needs. But there remain many children conceived by IVF or as a result of a casual liaison in or just before marriage, who remain entirely ignorant of the fact that they are not living with the two biological parents that they think they are. The trouble is that whilst at the end of the day, children usually find truth easier than fiction, the responsible adults do not always see it that way. And a serious difference over welfare develops with the risk that the truth will come out in some angry, uncontrolled way in the course of some family argument, as all too often can happen. An unusual but vivid example of uh, what children are entitled to know is to be found in a case that I heard where a man had been convicted of sexual assault upon three daughters. Years later, he married a woman whom he told of his conviction, but they agreed as a couple not to tell their own children about it. As those children grew into adolescence, the local authority discovered the position and wanted the children told so that they could self-protect. The parents refused, saying, probably with some justification, that such a revelation would be more than the children could cope with it was certainly more than the adults could handle. And the question arose as to whether it was in their best interest to know, not least because the effect of the local authority intervention had been that the father had begun to live apart and that the contact they had was always in the presence of their mother. No reason having been given to them for this change of affairs. Well, I decided that they should know whatever the impact on them and the pain and stress to the family might be. Although there was more than one rational outcome to that dispute, the decision was left intact by both the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court because this was a true discretionary decision. Despite the grave consequences of the decision, it was regarded as a legitimate act of discretion 
and therefore was effectively beyond challenge on appeal in the way that we saw in the first lecture. This discretionary jurisdiction is often most vividly illustrated in the area of medical treatment, especially where a decision might have irreversible consequences. Again, may I take two examples from judicial experience to show what I mean. In one case, a baby had suffered a catastrophic brain injury in a domestic accident for which no one was to blame. In due course, the treating team concluded that any further treatment was futile and thus all invasive treatment should be withdrawn and the child allowed to die. Unsurprisingly, the parents objected, not least on the basis that whilst there's life, there's hope. The case had to be decided on the basis that the welfare of that child should be the court's paramount consideration. That meant, of course, that preserving life was the starting point, although not necessarily the decisive point in the end. Finally, I authorised the withdrawal of treatment and the child did indeed die within 24 hours. How does that square with a discretionary welfare approach? Of course, the child was never going to survive without invasive treatment and everyone accepted that the child could not remain on it forever. In that sense, premature death was inevitable. Well, I reasoned the case on the basis of an innate human desire for a good death. And whilst it was not easy to describe a good death for a child, it was possible to describe a bad death. Isolated from all human contact whilst wired up to invasive machinery in the course of futile treatment. Now, you will not find that reasoning in any statute or in any textbook. It was the exercise of the discretionary jurisdiction on welfare in the hands of one particular judge. Are we happy with it? Does that kind of approach elicit the general consent of society? Well, at least this child had a good death in the arms of parents. Let me take a second example. A married woman whose four children had been removed permanently from the care of both parents on the grounds of complete parental incompetence. Nevertheless, both parents remained sexually active and committed to each other. Another child and another contested removal was therefore almost inevitable. The mother's learning difficulties disabled her from making decisions about pregnancy, let alone from parenting. I found that it was in her best interests to have an invasive long-term contraceptive device fitted under general anaesthetic. The reasons for my doing that will no doubt be fairly obvious. But does the exercise uh, or indeed the existence of such a power elicit a general consent within society? At the heart of all these issues where the best interests of adults are concerned lies an innate tension between protection on the one hand and autonomy on the other. The law seeks the promotion of the autonomy of a protected person whilst at the same time granting powers to secure their protection. In that, I think the law probably reflects the, value, the views of society generally. But however much we may want both, not infrequently, a choice between them has to be made. Now, I consider this issue in some detail in my inaugural lecture, and now is not the time to repeat it. But may I perhaps take one, one example to illustrate the point. A man in his 80s had wrecked his brain with alcohol and had effectively lost everything. However, he had been taken into their home by a widow and her grown-up son. And there they lived together in what has to be described as a degree of squalor. He became ill. He had to be admitted to hospital, but recovered and was ready for discharge. It was the unanimous view of all professionals 
that he should be admitted on a permanent basis to a care home, whereas he, and indeed the widow, were very keen on him returning to her home. It was a classic collision between protection and autonomy. It was also a classic collision between the demands of emotional welfare on the one hand and physical welfare on the other. A care home would, of course, provide for all his physical needs, <clears throat> whereas the widow's home, even with help, was likely to be barely adequate. However, with her, he would belong and be contented, which is not the way he saw life in the care home. Well, I allowed a return home, fully recognizing the risk of so doing, but asserting that in this case at least, emotional welfare, albeit unmeasurable, should take precedence over physical welfare, which is, of course, very measurable. Now, you will not find that in any statute or textbook. It was simply the exercise of a discretionary power in the hands of a trial judge. And we have to ask whether we're happy with it. Does it elicit the general consent of society? And so we have to go on and recognize that the demands of welfare will sometimes conflict with public policy, such as where people go overseas, enter into a commercial surrogacy agreement, perfectly legal over there, but wholly illegal here, and then bring the child back to this country. Under the law of that country, shall we say California, for example, they are now the legal parents of that child who takes their parents' nationality. Under our law, of course, the surrogates remain the natural parents and the child retains American nationality. <clears throat> and there are problems at the border. The child is a legal orphan with no rights of residence here and nowhere else to go. Well, in the end, we have decided that in the absence of fraud or oppression, the welfare of the child trumps both the illegal acts of the parents and the requirements of public policy. A parental order is made conferring parental status on them. There is a real choice to be made. And in these circumstances, the judges or the three of us who've done this work have decided to allow welfare to prevail over the law and over the political policy that underpinned the act. Are we happy with that? How does that sit with Lord Bingham's views about justice? And does it elicit the general consent of society? I hope that I've been able to demonstrate the profound nature of not only the discretionary powers that judges possess, but the profound consequences of the exercise of those powers. It is not surprising that Lord Bingham urges caution over discretion. And my questions are, do we know the nature and extent of these powers, and do they elicit the general consent of the society in whose name they are exercised. Could we perhaps, on the other hand, inject rather more certainty into our system without this considerable reliance on discretion? <clears throat> well, the only real alternative to discretionary decision-making is to have rule-based decision-making. Let me take two examples uh, to show you what I mean. The first relates to Sharia law uh, in relation to children upon the separation of their parents. And uh, <clears throat> an English Muslim family lawyer, practicing barrister in Birmingham, as it happens, uh, in her book explains it thus, quote, unlike English law, Sharia law has clearly stipulated rules as to which parent will take care of the child according to the child's age, gender, wishes and feelings, and of course, best interests. Therefore, whilst there are clearly defined instances where a mother has residence and when a father has residence, according to Sharia, Islamic scholars are required to measure any decision they make with the yardstick of best interests. 
so that even in a clear rule-based legal approach there is a residual discretionary judgment still to be made. The second example comes from family property law. In English law, the distribution of family property on divorce is a discretionary exercise based on a whole list of considerations in section 25 of the Matrimonial Causes Act, and each case has to be determined on its own facts, uh, applying the principles in the statute. Whereas in Scotland, and indeed in many European jurisdictions, the distribution of family property on divorce is provided for in rules and is therefore far less flexible than the English system. Now, of course, a rule-based approach allows for much certainty and allows for clarity of advice to be given as to the outcome of a case. But it can and does produce unjust results in individual cases. Whilst the discretionary approach may permit a just outcome in each case, it produces uncertainty and makes giving advice difficult and that may provoke rather than quench dispute. The argument between discretion and a rule-based approach will no doubt rumble on. The English tradition, at least in the field of family and mental capacity law, tends strongly towards a discretionary approach with the consequence that the law develops incrementally on a case-by-case -case basis. The more I reflect on this question of judicial discretion, and I have thought much about it over the last 20 years, the more I am conscious of the power which society has put into the judges' hands and which generally Parliament has shown no desire to curtail. The truth is that the system can only work credibly for so long as judges receive and of course deserve the confidence and consent of the society in whose name they act. That trust to be real must be predicated on an understanding of the nature and extent of those powers and that has been one of the principal purposes of this lecture series. In the last lecture, I want to draw these threads together and to see how role and responsibilities and powers of the modern judge stand in relation to the society in whose name they are exercised. However, before doing that, <clears throat> I want to examine one final area of discretionary power that attracts much public and media comment and criticism, namely criminal sentencing. The nature of the discretion exercised there is quite different and much more restricted than what we have been considering today. But it does have to be considered and weighed in any assessment of the place of the judge in modern society. Thank you very much. Mm.